Hello everybody. Today I am starting module 10. That is the lecture for 10 weeks. Uh, and it is the first lecture. So 10th week lecture I am now starting. And uh, first lecture will be on the subject uh, matter of approximate approaches for vibration analysis. So in this case we will see that how a approximate method can be chosen to analyze the vibrational parameters, especially the model parameters when the closed form expressions are not possible or difficult to obtain. In such a case, the approximate method gives uh, the acceptable results and useful for practical application. Now, today what I am going to tell you about the approximate method. There are different approximate method, but today I will discuss the first method which is commonly used and which gives an almost uh, correct estimate of the fundamental natural frequency of a discrete system or continuous system. And this method is known as Rayleigh's method. Then after explaining the principle of Rayleigh's method and procedure to apply this uh, for solving the problem, I will go for solving different examples using the Rayleigh's method. Okay. So first let me tell you why approximate method is needed. Because this is a approximate method, so generally we will not prefer, but it becomes a necessity when we cannot get a close form solution of the uh, vibration problems. Accuracy of the result of the approximate method is actually influenced by some parameters. What are the parameters? If you give incorrect input such as material properties that is uh, your density, Poisson ratio, modulus of elasticity etc. Then uh, the result may be inaccurate and loading boundary condition else also have to be given correctly. So incorrect data input sometimes results in inaccurate results. Boundary condition is also important that actually in a, a uh, practice the actual boundary condition can never be satisfied. So fixed condition that we assume in practice it is it cannot be perfectly fixed. So there may be some partial fixity. So in that case it is difficult to satisfy the boundary condition with the uh, approximate method. Calculation error also involved. So that is due to incorrect assumption. Suppose we assume a Euler Bernoulli beam assumption, even the depth of the beam is uh, large compared to this uh, width, that means span depth ratio is higher than 10, then the assumption of Euler Bernoulli beam will give may give the inaccurate results. Efficiency of the numerical techniques is also important. There are various numerical techniques that has to be used to solve the approximate the problem with approximate method. So therefore, efficiency is also a concern. Then truncation error, if we take a series solution, you can take uh, the number of terms, say first three terms or first five terms or even say with one term you can calculate. So this is one question at what terms you will truncate this series. So these are the factors which influence the accuracy of the results. Okay. Now the different approximate methods are available in application. So these are Rayleigh's method, Rayleigh's method, Galerkin method, finite difference method. So all these methods that I have listed I will discuss but there are other methods also available say collocation method then finite element method is also an approximate method. So these two methods, collocation method and finite element method will not be discussed in this course. Okay. Now first let us start with the Rayleigh's method. This method is used to obtain the approximate value of the fundamental frequency. Other higher frequency may not be obtained by Rayleigh's method 
but one can try it will not give the correct results if other frequencies are attempted but fundamental frequency that is most useful property for the uh, design of uh, structure to avoid the resonance in dynamic condition can be obtained uh, very close to the exact uh, value with the help of Rayleigh's method. It can be used for discrete as well as continuous system. It is not necessary that uh, Rayleigh's method can be applied only for continuous system. Even for discrete system which are having multi degrees of freedom system then if we use the release method for a discrete system of multi-degree freedom uh, system then we can also find the good estimate of the fundamental frequency. Other frequencies can also be op obtained but error will be large, larger in higher frequency. Now release uh, method is based on the energy that is the kinetic energy and potential energy. So, what does the principle say? Release principle is stated as the frequency of vibration of a conservative system vibrating about an equilibrium position has a stationary value in the neighborhood of a natural mode. This stationary value is actually a minimum in the neighborhood of the fundamental mode. So, this is the release principle. So, now let us see how to get the stationary value of this uh, this uh, frequency in the neighborhood of a natural mode that is the primary concern in the release method ok. So, for a conservative system we know that total energy E is the total energy is constant. So, that is the uh, principle that we know from the conservation of energy. When the system passes through the equilibrium position the potential energy is 0, equilibrium position potential energy is 0, but kinetic energy has a maximum value equal to the total energy. So, in that case potential energy is 0, but kinetic energy is maximum. So, this equation the total energy now becomes 0 plus T max, T max is the maximum kinetic energy when the body or a particle passes through the equilibrium position. Again, when the body or system reaches the maximum displacement, then the potential energy is maximum whereas kinetic energy is 0. So, this is equal to V max plus 0. Ultimately, the total energy E is constant. So, this is the principle of Rayleigh's uh, method that maximum kinetic energy has to be equated to the maximum potential energy to get the estimate of fundamental natural frequency during vibration ok. Now, the harmonic motion is assumed in the free vibration and free vibration is always harmonic and let the motion rep is represented by a time function f t which has a frequency omega. So, therefore, t max for a multi degree freedom system. Uh, for a particular eigen vector, if I select the eigen vector, any eigen vector, so it will be T max equal to half u. U is the uh, vector, eigen vector transpose. Then m is the mass matrix, and then u is the again this eigen vector. So and then omega square. So this is the maximum uh, kinetic energy because kinetic energy requires your this uh, velocity square. So, if f t is a time function, f t is a time function which is given by a sin omega t, then your this uh, velocity will be f t equal to a omega cos omega t. So, in that case the f t square f t square that is required for kinetic energy omega square cos square omega t. So, in that case we can assume that a the constant a will be plugged to the eigenvectors and then 
the maximum value of cos omega t is 1. So therefore amplitude of the square of the velocity is omega square a square omega square a square will be combined with this u this eigenvector and therefore we get the maximum kinetic energy as this vector u that is represents the eigenvector in a multi degree freedom system transpose m m is the mass matrix mass matrix and again u is the eigenvector and omega is the natural frequency natural frequency if i have uh, a approximate knowledge of the eigenvector in any mode i am expecting to get the natural frequency in that mode but if our my assumption is very close to the correct value of the eigenvectors i will get the result very close to the exact results now here t max is t star into omega square where t star is the reference kinetic energy it is generally known as reference kinetic energy equal to half u transpose m into u okay so in this connection kinetic energy is obtained maximum kinetic energy now let us look to uh, to the maximum potential energy maximum potential energy is denoted by v max v max is the maximum potential energy and it is equal to half u transpose k u and k is the this your stiffness matrix k is the stiffness matrix so in that case this matrix k can be found by different procedure and it is your stiffness matrix For multi degree system over n degrees of freedom system, our k will be n by n size square matrix, and this vector u will be n cross 1. Okay. Now, equating maximum kinetic energy to the maximum potential energy, this is the Rayleigh's principle. We get omega square equal to V max by T star, and this is nothing but a function of u eigenvector and this is known as r u so r u is called the Rayleigh's quotient and Rayleigh's quotient is nothing but square of the energy the equation for Rayleigh's quotient has the minimum value as per the principle of Rayleigh when the vector u is identical with the first eigenvector u1 so this is the first eigenvector corresponding to fundamental mode and in that case Rayleigh's quotient is minimum and it gives the correct estimate of the uh, this uh, natural frequency. Okay. Now if a system, system may be modeled with a discrete uh, procedure that is uh, with a lump mass system or with a continuous uh, distributed parameter system that is a continuous system. So when lump mass parameter is used to model a continuous system then say m1, m2 etc are the lump masses which is uh, actually used to model a beam or shaft. Then if we know the approximate deflected shape in the fundamental uh, mode then we can write the maximum potential energy which will be due to gravitational effect so therefore maximum potential energy here you can see u max is equal to half g m1 y1 plus m2 y2 like that and then t max the maximum kinetic energy half omega square m1 y1 square plus m2 y2 square etc so therefore the omega square becomes g this summation i varies from 1 to whatever the number of masses are present you have to give this in the upper limit of the summation then m i y i similarly in the denominator this becomes summation i m i y i square so this is the estimate of the
fundamental natural frequency if one goes uh, prefers the modeling by lump masses okay now let us discuss how the Rayleigh quotient can be found out for a continuous system so in that case i will uh, give an example of uh, this longitudinal vibration of rod of variable mass and uh, variable axial rigidity and then i will discuss a problem with a cantilever beam but procedure for continuous system is same you can apply it for longitudinal vibration of beams or a string or a bending vibration of beam then bending vibration of plate membrane etc you can use now let us assume the uxt is the longitudinal displacement of the rod consider a rod of variable cross section that is m is a function of x and a the flexural rigidity is also function of x this is x axis this is y axis so if the rod is under axial vibration that means displacement along x axis is u then we are concerned with this uh, longitudinal displacement then u can be assumed as a space function say capital u x multiplied by f t is the time function with that assumption we can go forward to find out the kinetic energy and potential energy now we shall again assume that ft is a harmonic function and we will uh, establish the frequency equation for the uh, this longitudinal vibration of beam using the release approach now kinetic energy at any instant of time if i want to get the velocity so del u by del t is the velocity so that is nothing but ux f dot t f dot represent the first derivative of f t now the kinetic energy of the bar will be at any time instant will be half m x then velocity square and we have to integrate from 0 to l now with that expression now we get the kinetic energy here half f dot square t that is the velocity square that is the function uh, time function f is uh, differentiated with time so we are getting half f dot square and that is uh, not containing this space variable x so we are taking outside the integral sign then integration is carried out with the product of mx and u square x so this is the maxima uh, kinetic energy at any instant of time similarly potential energy for the uh, rod the strain energy we actually call it strain energy strain energy is nothing but half a e a is a function of x then del u by del x whole square dx 0 to l so with that uh, expression we now can write this half f square t integration 0 to l a e is a function of x in general d capital u by dx whole square so this is the potential energy at any instant of time when the body is in motion and kinetic energy at any instant of time but for harmonic motion we assume that f t is equal to a sin omega t hence maximum value of kinetic and potential energy will be t max will be s square omega square by 2 integration 0 to l m is a function of x into u square x dx whereas maximum kinetic energy will be s square by 2 integration 0 to l a e in x is a space variable in general into du by dx whole square integration 
with respect to dx. So, we get maximum kinetic energy and maximum potential energy. So, for continuous system, we require to find the strain energy of the system uh, in which mode the vibration takes place. Suppose it is in axial vibration. So, we take the uh, potential energy for this uh, axial force, uh, axial vibration and then we get the kinetic energy assuming that uh, motion is harmonic. The maximum kinetic energy can be obtained in terms of this natural frequency a, a, omega square and then again you are getting this uh, the maximum potential energy. Now one has to equate these two. So, T max should be equal to V max. So, these two expressions should be equal to get the natural frequency. Hence, omega square which is nothing but the Rayleigh's quotient is obtained as the integration 0 to L A e is a function of x du by dx whole square dx divided by 0 to L mx u square x dx. Ru is called the Rayleigh's quotient. Now here also the Rayleigh's quotient is minimum when ux is the first normal mode. Uh, to solve a problem with a Rayleigh's method, it is necessary to assume the expression for u satisfying the boundary condition. If it is done, if all the boundary conditions are satisfied uh, by u, then it uh, gives you the quite accurate results. But ux should be such where the exact solution is obtained. ux should satisfy the differential equation as well as boundary condition. But here we are not testing, we are not verifying the differential equation. So, we are only verifying the boundary condition where it uh, matches the boundary condition by selecting a suitable function and then we are going ahead to find out the fundamental natural frequency. Since it is not certain whether ux will satisfy the differential equation of motion that ux may all only satisfy the boundary conditions therefore the result that we obtain is not called the exact result it is an approximate result. However, the accuracy can be increased by choosing ux in such a way that it satisfies the geometrical as well as force boundary condition. If all the boundary conditions are not satisfied even the assumed u can be applied for release method but the accuracy may be affected. Again the ux may be taken as a different types of function polynomial, trigonometrical and number of terms are also important that you would take for the mode shape function. However, in this case to obtain the fundamental frequency uh, only the ux that we choose should satisfy the boundary condition preferably the geometric boundary conditions but if satisfy the natural boundary conditions that is the force boundary condition then also it is acceptable then the result will be very close to the exact result. Now it gives very correctly the estimate of fundamental frequency. Other frequency suppose you give uh, assume ux uh, corresponding to the other mode then it is expected that you will get the frequency in the corresponding to that mode but uh, it will not give as accurate as you are getting the fundamental mode. Okay. Now let us come to the bending vibration of beam. Now in a bending a part of the beam deflects or a beam deflects and you will see that beam the deflected beam the elastic curve is forming this uh, arc where the r is the radius of the uh, this circle okay it bends in the form of a circular arc in pure bending 
so we are assuming that r is the radius of curvature if w is the deflection of the beam transverse deflection of the beam then slope is defined as dw by dx so work done in a transverse deflection that is which uh, produces slope due to bending of the beam is equal to half m d theta for a small element that is uh, dx which uh, subtends an angle d theta at the center so m d theta half m d theta is the work done and it is stored as a strain energy this work done is due to the bending moment which produces slope and theta is nothing but the first derivative of the deflection dw by dx hence we can also obtain the curvature curvature is the reciprocal of the radius and it is equal to 1 by r equal is d theta by dx equal to d square w by dx square so second derivative of w is related to the curvature from theory of beam bending we know that 1 by r is equal to m by ei so utilizing these relations and this theta is dw by dx we can get the strain energy of the beam is equal to u and it is nothing but half integration ei t square w by dx square whole square dx and integration with limit 0 to l where l is the length of the beam it is written in the form of curvature which involves the second derivative another expression that can be found instead of curvature if we uh, use the uh, bending moment which is a, again function of x then we can write the strain energy as half integration 0 to l m square dx divided by ei so both the expression can be used and you will find that some expression which involves derivatives especially the higher derivative has a chance of accumulating more error that we will see whereas this expression m which does not uh, involve derivative of the process that is it, m is not coming as a derivative of the deflection here so there the chances of error is less let us verify this okay so now take an example of cantilever beam and uh, for simplicity we have taken the uniform mass uniform flexural rigidity and uniform length and let us assume a deflected shape of the cantilever beam as equal to capital W is Cx square. So this is the deflected shape W is equal to Cx square. Now we require different derivatives. So let us uh, find the derivatives and test whether the uh, this assumed deflected shape satisfy the boundary condition. So boundary condition is at x is equal to 0 and at x is equal to L. These two position will see the boundary condition. Say Wx if I take at x is equal to 0 according to this expression it is 0 and x is equal to L it is not 0 obviously it does not require that 0 value has to be obtained at the free end. So boundary condition on deflection is satisfied in both the n where this uh, wx is chosen or c the constant is chosen appropriately. Then let us come to the slope condition. At the fixed end of the cantilever the slope is 0 and therefore the slope is given by 2cx and it is 0. At the free end of course there is no question of 0 slope. So therefore it is not coming in the question and therefore slope and deflection condition is satisfied at the free end. But let us see the other uh, force boundary condition. At the free end we know that bending moment and shear force has to be 0. Now if I see the bending moment that is which is related to mx which is related to double derivative of wx 
is 2c and at uh, x is equal to l zero bending moment does not come into picture so zero bending moment question is not satisfied with the double derivative that is becoming a constant and third derivative that gives the shear force shear force a q third derivative of w and shear force is zero everywhere as per this relationship and it is also only this at x is equal to l this is satisfied zero shear force so this condition is partially satisfied partially satisfied but this slope and deflection is fully satisfied that at the fixed end we are getting zero slope and zero deflection so let us see with this function how we can use the release method and get the estimate of first frequency that is fundamental frequency and let us compare the result with the exact value that is known to us now maximum potential energy there is the strain energy stored in the beam is u max equal to integration 0 to l e by 2 d square w by dx square there is the second derivative of w whole square dx and after integration you will get 2 c square e i l so this is the maximum potential energy now let us calculate the maximum kinetic energy maximum kinetic energy half m omega square w square so w square x dx and w is equal to c x square so here again we are getting this c square x to the power 4 so after integration it become m omega square c square l to the power 5 divided by 5 and this 5 into 2 becomes 10 so maximum kinetic energy is m omega square c square l to the power 5 divided by 10 whereas maximum potential energy is 2 c square e i l now we have to equate the maximum potential energy with the maximum kinetic energy according to Rayleigh's principle the maximum potential energy is equated to the maximum kinetic energy and we get here m omega square c square l to the power 5 divided by 10 equal to 2 c square e i l which ultimately gives omega square equal to 20 into e i divided by m l to the power 4 so omega that is after taking the square root it becomes 4.47 root over e i by m l to the power 4 let us compare the results with the exact value the exact value of the fundamental natural frequency that we have solved uh, when we discussed the beam vibration transverse vibration of beam and we have found that for cantilever end conditions that is one end fixed and other end free this clamp free beam we have found that omega is equal to 3.515 root over ei by ml to the power 4 so that is the exact result and here we are getting uh, approximate result is uh, release method gives the result release method here gives the result omega is equal to 4.47 root over ei by ml to the power 4 and release method here is obtained only by assuming this no other term is taken so therefore omega is equal to 4.47 ei ml to the power 4 is the approximate but let us see what is the error if i calculate the percentage error then it becomes 27.2 percent it is too large so due to significant error in this process some authors have thought that why not to avoid the derivative of the 
shape function in calculation of maximum potential energy. So therefore, some modification has been done uh, using the moment bending moment instead of the curvature curvature which uses the the second derivative of the deflection. So avoiding this, Gremel has proposed a bending moment expression in the strain energy calculation. So Gremel modification is what he considered the inertia loading on the beam. Inertia loading Qx is nothing but m omega square Wx if the Ft is harmonic. Ft is harmonic so we are getting this and Wx is nothing but Cx square. So inertia loading is m omega square Cx square that means loading is also varying quadratically. So this is the variation of the load. Let us take a small element of the beam of length dj at a distant j. So this element is taken in the beam at a distance j. Now the inertia load on the this element is this uh, m omega square c j square d j. So this is the inertia load on this beam where it is taken as the uniform over the small uh, element and therefore we get the load on this beam as m omega square c j square d j. Now the moment of this load about a section here which is at a distance x from the origin. Let us take this as the origin reference point and we measure x positive in this direction and the deflection that is the w in this direction. So if I want to calculate the bending moment at this section which is at a distance x, we can calculate this uh, moment of this force. So therefore on this small element dmx the elementary bending moment is equal to m omega square c j square d j this is the force and it distance from the centroid of the load uh, to the section will be j minus x. So this is the moment on the elementary area, force on the elementary area, moment of the force acting on the elementary length. Okay. Now integrating uh, the bending moment of all such element we can get the expression for mx which is a function of x is m omega square c j square j minus x dj and limit of the integration will be x to l. So this is the limit of the integration that we have put here. Now this integration we have seen the integration has to be carried out with respect to j. So therefore we have taken m omega square c outside the integral sign and then integration has to be done with this j cube minus j square x dj. After carrying out this integration we are getting m omega square c j to the power 4 divided by 4 minus j cube by 3 into x and limit x l has to be substituted here. So after putting the limit in this expression we now get the mx as m omega square c divided by 12 into x to the power 4 minus 4 x l cube plus 3 l to the power 4. So this is the expression for mx which is to be used now in the calculation of strain energy. So now strain energy uh, or maximum potential energy you can call is given by integration 0 to l m square x divided by 2 ei dx. Since the beam is of uniform cross section we can take it out and therefore uh, using the expression for mx that we get here uh, the expression for mx we get this. So this can be used here and we now get this 
m omega square c divided by 12 whole square because m square has to be written inside the integral and 1 by 2 e i is the constant term so we have taken it out and integration has to be carried out of this term after expanding so x to the power 4 minus 4 x l cube plus 3 l to the power 4 whole square so this can be expanded and then term by term integration can be carried out and after putting limit 0 to l we now get the maximum potential energy as omega to the power 4 divided by 2 ei into m square c square divided by 144 into 312 divided by 135 l to the power 9. Now let us calculate so maximum potential energy is calculated. So let us take the maximum kinetic energy. How you calculate the maximum kinetic energy? Because half 0 to L m omega square w square and w square is nothing but w is c x square. So w is c x square that our assumed deflection shape. So here substituting this c square x to the power 4 and integration is straight forward that we get x to the power 5 by 5 and after putting limit it becomes L to the power 5 divided by 5 and here 2 is there, half is there, so 5 into 2, 10. So in the new denominator you are getting 10 and in the denominator m omega square c square l to the power 5. Now we have to equate T max equal to U max, release principle, release principle. So if I use this then I will be able to extract omega square. So in the next step I have equated this maximum potential energy to the maximum kinetic energy. This is the maximum potential energy and from where omega square can be found out as 12.46 Ei divided by ml to the power 4. Now the square root of this will give the frequency in uh, uh, radian per second that is angular natural frequency. So that is equal to 3.53 root over Ei divided by ml to the power 4. Whereas the exact value that we written earlier, exact value of natural frequency is 3.515 Ei by ml to the power 4. So it is written here and therefore percentage error if I calculate again we write that new frequency that 3.53 minus 3.515 this is the difference divided by correct frequency 3.515 into 100 so error is only 0.43 percent. You can see the difference when we use the curvature that is while calculating the potential energy using the assumed deflection shape if we use uh, the curvature expression that is ei by 2 integration 0 to l d square w by dx square whole square then we are getting 27 percent error but when we avoid the second derivative because second derivative is related to bending moment and you can see from this assumed mode shape that uh, c x square the bending moment condition at the free end is not satisfied. So therefore this involves error or this gives uh, produces error in the result and hence avoiding this uh, expression that is the derivative expression Gramel has proposed to use the uh, moment expression to evaluate the strain energy and therefore we get less error here. So basic reason for getting the less error is that we avoided the second derivative of the process although the first derivative and the function itself satisfy the fixed end condition properly but the zero bending moment condition at the free end is not satisfied by the assumed mode shape function that is Cx square. Now let us see 
what will be effect of natural frequency if we assume the axial strain axial strain sometimes we neglect but if axial strain is included then what will be the effect of natural frequency let us take a beam and this is the deflected shape the curve length is ds so if i take the curve length ds which is in the small element which is almost straight line and this dy dx this is approximately taken as straight line so therefore we now get ds is equal to dy whole square plus dx whole square so with this expression we now get the change of length change of length will be actually the increase of length will be ds minus dx so therefore we are writing this root over dx square plus dy square minus dx into root over 1 plus dy by dx whole square minus 1 into dx after simplifying this and you can see this expression that inside the square root that is nothing but dy dx square into half and using binomial expression using binomial binomial expansion one can get this series as equal to 1 plus half dy by dx whole square plus other terms higher order terms will be there so we are not going for higher order terms we are restricting only up to the first term so according to that this increase in length will be half dy by dx whole square dx hence additional strain energy that need to be included in the strain energy due to bending is du this is the additional strain energy so i give a subscript a D, uh, du a equal to half sigma is the axial strain and a is the area of cross sections so sigma a is the force and epsilon dx is the elongation so therefore we are getting the work done that is the strain energy stored due to uh, axial strain is half ea epsilon square dx now this expression has to be integrated to get the total uh, potential energy uh, that will be added to the strain energy due to bending now you can see this part is strain energy due to bending you can see this this is the strain energy due to bending due to bending and this part is strain energy due to axial deformation since we have not neglected here so we are including this so this is the total uh, potential energy maximum and this is the maximum kinetic energy so equating these two again we get the expression for fundamental frequency according to Rayleigh's principle so here the expression for fundamental frequency that is square of the frequency is ei integration 0 to l d square y by dx square and then uh, this will be whole square okay plus 1 by 4 a 0 to l dy by dx whole square dx this term is additional when we neglect the axial strain this term need not be incorporated when we neglect the axial strain we can omit this term fully so this will represent the same uh, as we have uh, taken in the beam bending in case of cantilever so let us illustrate this with a problem consider a fixed standard beam of uniform cross-sectional area A 
and moment of inertia i with uh, homogeneous material of density rho and modulus of elasticity capital E with approximation of first normal mode derive an expression for the fundamental natural frequency taking account of the axial strain. So what we have derived now let us apply this uh, in this problem. Now here you can see that rho is the density so mass will be rho into a mass per unit length is rho into a and a is the axial rigidity m is the mass per unit length ei is the flexural rigidity and l is the total length of the beam total length of the beam is here to here now fixed ended beam has the boundary condition that deflection at the both ends will be zero as well as the slope at the ends will be zero. So this is the condition that we impose in the solution of boundary value problem in fixed ended beam that is fixed fixed beam. Now let us assume a function capital Y equal to C, C is a constant into 1 minus cos 2 pi x by L. So with this function let us see at this position this is the position x is equal to L we can see when we substitute x is equal to 0 y is 0 and y prime that is the first derivative which gives the slope of the beam is uh, 2 pi by L into C sin 2 pi x by L again when we put this x is equal to 0 dy by dx is 0. So slope and deflection both are satisfied at the end where x is equal to 0. Now let us come to this end where x is equal to L. At this end again you will find if you put x is equal to L here, if you put x is equal to L here, then you will get uh, cos 2 pi and cos 2 pi is 1. So again y is 0 and y prime again if you put uh, here x is equal to L sin 2 pi is 0. So therefore y prime that is dy by dx again at this end is 0. So both the slope and deflection conditions which are essential boundary condition in the fixed beam are satisfied. So we expect to get a uh, very reasonable result with the help of this function. Okay. Now let us proceed. Using Rayleigh's principle we now equate the maximum kinetic energy half m omega square integration 0 to l y square dx equal to maximum potential energy half ei 0 to l d square y by dx square whole square plus 1 by 8 ae 0 to l dy by dx whole square dx. This is coming due to axial deformation. axial deformation. This is strain energy due to axial deformation. This part only which is a new feature in this problem but whereas this is due to bending. Strain energy due to bending. due to bending ok. So now after simplifying we get this uh, m omega square 0 to l y square dx ei 0 to l d square y by dx square whole square dx plus 1 by 4 a e 0 to l integration dy by dx whole square dx. Integrating this uh, left hand side, left hand side if I carry out the integration this becomes m omega square c square and y square we have to uh, that is y square we substituted this 1 minus cos 2 pi x by l of course the coefficient c is taken outside the integral sign and this is expanded after expanding we are getting 3 terms 1 minus 2 cos 2 pi x by l plus cos square 2 pi x by l and this term by term integration is carried out. So we are getting this integration of this 
becomes 0 and we are here getting after integration L and here L by 2. So therefore we are getting 3m omega square c square L divided by 2. So this is the maximum kinetic energy that actually the T max that we have evaluated of course the half is omitted here because half we have cancelled. So this is actually not T max but it is the twice the T max okay two times the T max anyway because in this expression after simplification this if I multiply both sides by 2 then it becomes this half is omitted here half will be also omitted here and here it will be 1 by 4. So now let us see this first part of the right hand side. So right hand side is this ei 0 to l d square y by dx square whole square dx. So first part of the right hand side after integration it becomes ei 16 pi to the power 4 divided by l to the power 4 c square into l by 2 that is 8 pi to the power 4 divided by l cube ei c square. Second part of the right hand side that is the axial strain energy that is due to this axial deformation that part when we integrate we get a by 4 4 pi square c square divided by l square into l by 2. So the result is a divided by 2 l pi square c square. Then the expression for omega square the numerator is this ei 0 to l d square y by dx square whole square dx plus 1 by 4 a 0 to l dy by dx whole square and uh, this numerator this this is the numerator which contains the potential energy part and denominator is the kinetic energy part so m integration 0 to l y square dx so substituting the integration integral value that we have already obtained we now get the 8 pi to the power 4 divided by l cube ei plus a 2l pi square divided by 3 ml by 2. Now we are arranging this in two parts so that we can identify the we can compare the exact result because the exact result for the beam without axial uh, strain is available for the fixed ended beam and we can compare this. So if we write this in two parts, so first part is 16 pi to the power 4 divided by 3 ei by ml to the power 4 and second part is pi square by 3 ae by ml square. Now if I neglect the axial deformation then I should not consider this part totally I will omit this part. So neglecting this part if axial strain due to transverse deflection is neglected then we get only one part that one part is due to bending. So it is 16 pi to the power 4 divided by 3 ei ml to the power 4. So fundamental natural frequency becomes 22.792 root over ei by ml to the power 4. Now exact result is 22.3733 root over ei divided by ml to the power 4. The exact results for different kinds of boundary condition in beam bending, transverse vibration of beam was taught to you earlier and uh, therefore we knew this result and compared now and percentage error in that case become 1.87 percent. Let us summarize today's lecture. In this lecture Rayleigh's method was discussed. It is an approximate method suitable for the determination of fundamental frequency. Higher frequency may not be obtained by this method. There is the extension of Rayleigh's method with the uh, number of terms in the deflected uh, deflection shape and that is due to reach modification. So therefore this method is called as Rayleigh's method that will be discussed in the next class. The accuracy depends on the assumed function 
that should satisfy all boundary conditions geometrical as well as force boundary condition it is also noticed in this example that we have given that derivative of the assumed function when used for calculation of uh, potential energy that is the strain energy of the beam due to bending produces more error in the result even the assumed deflection function satisfy the boundary conditions there is the deflection and slope at the fixed end but in case of cantilever the free and bending moment is zero whereas by assuming the function of the form cx square we are not getting the bending moment at the free and zero so therefore error has crept up and uh, gremel has suggested a modification uh, to use the bending moment expression and how the bending moment is calculated bending moment is calculated after imposing the beam with inertia load so when the beam is loaded with the inertia force then the bending moment is calculated and due to this this uh, strain energy is calculated and the natural frequency gives uh, very close to the exact uh, results so release method is based on the conservation of total energy and we have solved some examples including this axial strain in the deformation of the beam. Thank you very much.